front door to steal my television set, they'll send six righteous defenders of my, of my rights to protect me. And now we have a war. That's the standard argument. And it's wrong. And it's wrong because wars have two problems. The first is they're very expensive. And the second is they give more or less random results. That if you imagine the service that a rights enforcement agency is selling, it's sort of nice if when you commit a crime you don't get arrested. But it's much nicer if when people commit crimes against you they do get arrested. That as a general rule, most crimes benefit the criminal by much less than they harm the victim. That's one reason we think of them as crimes. And therefore, the ability to protect the people who is in the, are in the wrong is worth less than the ability to protect the people in the right. So the, the two rights enforcement agencies say, we don't want to have a war. We don't want to have to pay hazard pay and have our, our customers' front lawns turn into free fire zones. Let's arbitrate this dispute. And since we know it'll happen again and again because we're operating in the same general area, let's agree in advance on a private court, an arbitration agency, which we will use to settle disputes between our customers. Now, it may occur to you, say, well, this agreement is very nice, but since in my world there is no government to enforce contracts, what is it that's going to make the rights enforcement agencies keep their contracts? And the answer is the discipline of constant dealing, the fact that they're repeat players. Each rights enforcement agency knows that if the first time its customer loses a case, it refuses to go along, then the next time the other agency won't, and they're back fighting each other, and they're going to lose business to more sensible competitors. So what I'm sketching now is a world in which you have a bunch of rights enforcement agencies. You have a network of agreement among them where each pair of them have agreed on a court. There might be many agreeing on the same court. There might be as many courts as there are pairs of agencies or anything in between. And now, how is the law being generated? The law is generated by the courts. The part of the product that each court is selling to the agencies is the set of legal rules that it uses to decide disputes, along with how quickly it decides them and how reliably and so forth. That is also part of the product that the agencies are selling to their customers, because the agencies know that the customers would like to live under a legal system that works well. They'd like to have cases disposed of quickly. They'd like to usually have the guilty guy lose and the innocent guy get acquitted. Uh, and therefore, the rights enforcement agencies have a market incentive to try to buy good legal systems, so to speak. The arbitration agencies have a market incentive to try to generate good legal systems. And you thus have a system where instead of having the legal system created by whoever has the best grip on the levers of power in the political system, you instead have a legal system which is created on the free market by people trying to provide a product people want to consume. If you compare it to the political system, the, there's what I think of as the civics class model of democracy, which is the idea that governments do good things because otherwise we'll vote them out. And for that to work, all the voters have to know what are good things and what the government is doing. But there is no incentive at all for a voter to know that, because the voter knows in a big country like the US or India that the chance his vote will affect anything is very, very close to zero. It's true if it does affect something, it could do a whole lot of good, but most of that good goes to other people. He only gets a little bit of it. So therefore, it makes much more sense to vote for the candidate who your friends like, because that'll make you popular with them, or the candidate who makes you feel good because he's a good orator and says nice, heart-moving things, rather than to do the hard work of figuring out whether the actual policies that candidate is pushing are good. Not only do you have no incentive to figure out who's the best, you also, it's very hard to get the information, because you can't do any market comparisons. No one will ever know how Obama's first term would compare to McCain's first term, because McCain lost the election and Obama won it. But in my world, you can compare how the rights protection that you, you are getting from your rights enforcement agency compares to the rights enforcement that your friend or your cousin or somebody else you know gets from his rights enforcement agency. So you have a system where the mechanisms for generating good law are, I am arguing, much superior to political mechanisms. So that's a sketch of the system I'm describing. I wonder how it would apply to India. We have two types of politicians. Politicians who sort of steal from the treasury, but are also interested in doing something because they want to come back. And politicians who just steal from the treasury because they're not interested in coming back. So how would you apply your system? And, and generally speaking, it's sort of north and south. 
But I'm not sure whether what you're asking is how do I get there, which is a very hard problem, or how would the system work if it existed? And if it existed, uh, somebody I mean, who had- you can sort of observe it going on in India right now that everybody steals from the treasury, a few of them actually do something for the citizen. But I'm not sure if you know which ones. After all, some of them maybe do something to the citizens. That, okay. As I put it a long time ago, ask not what the government is doing for you, ask what the government is doing to you. That was my government, but I bet it's so, true of yours so too. So in this, in, this, uh, in this society where uh, government either doesn't exist or exists very, very minimally, how, how would things like universalization work? So What is universalization? Which means uh, a flight to an inaccessible place, which wouldn't make sense in any private sector. Uh, Why should a telephone it? call to a village that has only 20 inhabitants, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, in, in the auctioning system, there's that, actually a reserve for universities. Why is, it, why is it desirable that people should consume goods or services that cost more than they're worth? Which I think is what you're saying. Right, because otherwise you'll get true anarchy. People fighting with each other if I, within a society, what, I mean, whether the society has national boundaries or not, if you can consume a set of goods and I can't, over time I will be disenchanted with whatever the boundary to that society that is. is in, any, in any society, different people have different things they can do and consume. Right? For example, I don't know if you've appreciated the fact that on your theory, the citizens of Delhi should all be here with machetes because you people get to consume decent weather. And I've just come from Delhi, and they don't get to consume decent weather. Uh, so, so, I mean, in any society, people will have, different people have different opportunities. But, but why in the world would you think it was a good thing to subsidize an airline trip, which is worth $20 to the people who take it and costs $100 to produce, making the society $80 poorer off? Well, airline, rail line, telecom, drinking water, and so on. So yeah. drinking water, for instance. So you, you, drinking your, water is valuable to people. Yeah. And they in, would have to pay disproportionately what do you mean dispro in, a, in, a, in a dry area? Yeah, of course. That is people who, you have, people in Delhi have to pay disproportionately to be cool. They need air conditioning. You don't. But people well, who are some, the, the people, electricity subsidized, pe but pe that's pe pe people, people, people who are in a place where water is plentiful will get water cheaply, and people who are in a place where water is scarce will get it at a higher price. Uh, that doesn't seem unreasonable. And in California at the moment, one of the water reasons is. we have a drought yeah. is that water is not being priced to farmers at its real cost. Uh, it turns out that the production, of the growing of alfalfa in, in California consumes a considerable number of times as much water as all of the cities in California. All right. So the cities are being told you've got to cut down your water consumption in order that very large amounts of water can be used to grow cattle feed. Now, maybe it's worth doing, but the way of finding out whether it's worth doing would be precisely to price water and see whether the farmers can bid the water away from the cities or vice versa. That there's no particular reason why everybody should get the same thing, whatever it costs. Okay, I'll let that go. Take primary education. You uh, mean primary schooling, I presume. Primary schooling. Yeah. Sometimes it's education and sometimes it isn't. Okay. Uh, the, the, well, all education can be that.